You can do the intro. Yeah. Okay, welcome to our channel as Sisters in Zion. We're KB, Corinna, Antonia, and Courtney. And we're excited to share our insights with all of you and welcome you to comment below with what you learned this last week. Feel free to share this video with others as well. There are some online resources and communities that are linked in the description below. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. Hey, this week we are covering uh, First and Second Peter. Rejoice with rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There were so many nuggets in uh, this uh, week's uh, "Come Follow Me," but I chose to start out with First uh, Peter four verses twelve through nineteen. It uh, reads, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. In, in this uh, uh, section, Peter told the saints, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. The end in this passage can also be translated as outcome or goal. Therefore, Peter's point was that the saints who endure adversity can receive their ultimate goal of salvation through Jesus Christ. For some Christians in Peter's day, enduring in faith did not mean enduring mortal difficulties such as illness. For them, enduring in faith resulted in their death. Peter's testimony was intended to strengthen all the saints of his time, including those whose faith would cost them their lives. Jesus Christ was an example of how to endure suffering. Jesus Christ's betrayal, Jesus Christ showed us the way to patiently endure sufferings. In 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, Peter specifically addressed household servants who in the Roman Empire were almost always slaves and were often mistreated by their masters. He taught about the difference between suffering for one's fault and enduring undeserved punishment. Peter encouraged servants to learn from the example of Jesus Christ, who was falsely accused before Jewish and Roman leaders, and yet did not retaliate. The Greek word Peter used was that, used that was translated as buffeted literally means to be struck with fists, and is the term used by both Matthew and Mark to describe the treatment of the master. Peter hinted at the contemptuous scorn of the Jewish leaders at Christ's silent acceptance of it, and Christ's silent acceptance of it. Peter mentioned the stripes the Lord received using the word which means bruise or the bloody wealth which results from lashing with a whip, which is exactly the result of a Roman scourging. While serving as a member of the 70 elder Alexander B. Morrison taught, Peter the great apostle who himself suffered a martyr's death recognized that divine merit is associated with patient suffering for Christ's sake but that little glory accrues to us when we suffer for our own sins. As we endure undeserved suffering, we develop Christ-like attributes that perfect our souls and bring us closer to him. Peter encouraged his readers to think it not strange when they are faced with a fiery trial. Peter's advice is relevant to any persecution that Christians suffer in behalf of their beliefs. And he reminded his readers that they ought to rejoice that they are counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. 
Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how our suffering can bring us closer to God. Suffering is universal. How we react to suffering is individual. Suffering can take us one of two ways. It can be a strengthening and a purifying experience combined with faith, or it can be a destructive force in our lives if we do not have the faith in the Lord's atoning sacrifice. The purpose of suffering, however, is to build and strengthen us. Elder Neil A. Maxwell noted the value of trials when he said, spiritual refinement is not only to make the gross more pure, but to further refine the already fine. From the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, he says, dear brethren, do not think that our hearts faint as though some strange thing happened unto us, for we have seen and been assured of all these things beforehand and have an assurance of a better hope than, uh, than that of our persecutors. Therefore, God hath, God hath made broad our shoulders for the burden. We glory in our tribulation because we know that God is with us, that he is our friend, and that he will save our souls. We do not care for them that kill the body. They cannot harm our souls. I love President Brigham Young and how he was so not trifling with words. In, a, in the Journal of Discourses, he says this, I wish to inform you, brethren and sisters, who have just arrived in these valleys, that all your trials hitherto are but a trifling in comparison to the trials you will now be called to meet and pass through. How many of you will continue faithful? Preserve yourselves in your integrity and in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have, you, you have come here expressly to be assembled with the saints. Your object in gathering was to forsake the wickedness that is in the world and to mingle with those who serve God with an undivided heart. And you expect to be faithful, but let me inform you that you will not all prove faithful. Some of you will apostatize. Can you tell who? You reply, no. But the first you are aware, some some of you will be off to California, perhaps with the words to catch or Carson. We don't care a deep which on your wagon covers as they were on wagon covers of some who started for Carson last spring. Some of you will be tempted above that which that above what you will bear will tamely submit to darkness and its powers to the evil influences of wicked spirits will forsake the faith and the devil will get the advantage of you. Your troubles have just commenced. You are on the threshold of the department that we're in. You will have fiery trials such as you've never heard. Some who have been here for years will come around you and say, well, brother and sister, how do you? Do you like the country and the people? I don't know. I guess I shall. I should like to have some things a little different, but this is a good people. Well, says an older, older, old brother who has been laboring in the church for years to save the people. I don't know about it. I understand that A says thus and so. I don't know about it. A few days ago, I saw a brother who seems to be a good brother talking with the president. He seems to be in close communion with the heads of the church and is all the time stealing horses. I really do not know about this. Very likely the Lord has suffered this old Mormon to stay in the church thus long to get some of you to apostatize. And when he succeeds, you will go to hell together. Thus you will be led step by step to deny the faith and to reduce the light that was in you to total darkness. One will reflect, I do not know about Brother John. There are some things in his character that look dark to me. And according to the religion I have embraced, I do not understand them. And there is James, if his conduct corresponds with the gospel as I have heard it preached in my native country. I do not know about it. I will look more narrowly into this. And at the first you know, you will retire to rest without praying with your family. And when you rise in the morning, you are meditating upon what John and James are doing. That you just saw one of them taking a pole from his, brother, from his neighbor's fence and you say, I don't know about this. This is a rather dark affair among the Latter-day Saints who have assembled here among all the nations to serve God. Well, wife, have you got your breakfast ready? Come on, family, breakfast is ready. Get it around the table. The wife's heart sinks, for she had been accustomed to hear this man pray, but there is no prayer this morning. A short blessing is asked, then breakfast is eaten, and the man looks up to John, James, Dick, Harry, the devil, 
and hell, and by and by, away he goes, another apostate. God gathers his people to school them. While you were in England, France, and other foreign countries, you were prepared to receive the oracles from heaven. No. Are you prepared now? No. Are those who have been in the church 20, 25, or 30 years prepared to have the visions of eternity open to them? No. To hear the voice of an angel Gabriel? No. How can you be prepared if you let little frivolous trifling afflictions and temptations overcome you and turn you away? The Lord has brought you here to try every fiber of your hearts, even as Abraham was tried in all things, to prove whether you are friends of God. And when you see anyone do wrong, you should say, that is nothing to me. He is in the hands of God and will have to answer to him and I for myself. And when you see persons about to give way to temptation, you should say to your families, let us pray to the Lord to give them strength and power to overcome the temptations of the evil ones, that they may remain here instead of apostatizing. Some of you will do as I have stated, but if you will be faithful to your covenants, you will not only be saviors to yourselves and to your wives and children, but also to your neighbors. When you see a neighbor begin to slip, pray for him that he may have the spirit of the gospel as he once had. And if you feel this, this spirit within yourselves, pray for an increase of that light you received when you first received the gospel and you will save yourself and house. Yet after all the labor that will be performed by the elders of Israel and traveling to the utmost parts of the earth in gathering all the people from all the nations, kindreds, tongues, and people and gathering home to Zion and Jerusalem and perhaps other places the Lord will appoint for the gathering of the people in the latter days. And after all the preaching, faith and toil that will be brought wrought by the servants of God when Christ comes there will be five foolish versions and five wise my exhortation to every man woman and child that has named the name of Christ my positive command to you which I urge upon you and which it is in your imperative duty to hearken and to and obey is to so live every moment that there will not be a dark spot upon your lives that you can say every night, the last is the best day I have ever lived. God be praised that I have been enabled to so live this day that I can go to sleep with a clear conscience. In short, so live that when you wake in the spirit world, you can truthfully say, I could not be better my mortal life where I lived it over again. I exhort you for the sake of the house of Israel, for the sake of Zion, which we are to build up, to so live from this time henceforth and forever, that your characters may with pleasure be scrutinized by holy beings. Live godly lives, which you cannot do without living moral lives. A man can commit sin and return to the Lord and receive forgiveness, but who has the assurance that he will have the power to repent? Who has the right and privilege granted unto him to swear or to take that which is not his own and make use of it for himself? I know of no such right. Who has a right to commit adultery? If anyone has such a permit from the Almighty, bring it forth and let us read it to the congregation that we may know it. Who has the right to bear false witness? Who has the right to defile himself by getting drunk? If you have this right, let us see it. If you have a right to disgrace your wives and children in the eyes of the people and God says it is just and true, bring about your authority and let us see it. I know of no person who has a right to sin. Brother Brigham, don't you sometimes sin? If I do, it is none of your business. And the whole of you are not smart enough to catch me in a wrong. Look back at my life since I have been preaching the gospel and point out, if you can, the iniquity I have committed. Have you not taken the name of God in vain? In vain? No. Uh, and not the first time have I ever used the name of my Savior or the name of a holy angel or the name of the mother of Jesus or the name of our Father in heaven with trifling feelings. Have you not taken that which was not your own? No, I have not been able to get a half of what is my own. I am going to have much more than I have, than I now have, not twice, not thrice, but a hundredfold more. I never yet felt that I had a license to commit a sin. And if I have not, who has? Some may imagine that I am boasting. You may call it what you please. God has preserved my feet and tongue, and I am here today. Though not so good as I ought to be, and you are not so good as you ought to be, there is a chance for all of us to be much better. Where is there a boy in this community who has the right to disgrace his father by sin? Where is the daughter who has the right to disgrace her mother by defiling herself? Have you such a license, young women? Have you such a license, young men? 
If you cannot show your license to commit sin, we shall consider you imposters and that you have no right and do not belong in our society. We will disfellowship all such men and women, whether old or young. They are already disfellowshipped in my feelings. You newcomers are here expressly to mingle your faith with the faithful and your acts with those who perform the acts of righteousness to bring together to Zion from every nation, kingdom, tongue, tongue and people, the good and the strength, power and wisdom of God that has been dispensed to the nations. Take hold with us who have been trying to purify ourselves and the people. It is your duty to take hold with us with your might to exalt righteousness. Look for God. Look to God for grace to purify yourselves instead of looking at your brethren. You who wish to be numbered with the wise virgins, keep your vessels full of oil. Do not let it burn out and lie down and sleep thinking that you can get a supply of oil when you wake. Be careful that you are not caught with your vessels empty. Keep them full and your hearts full of the Holy Spirit. Cease not to do good. By so doing, you will be numbered with the wise virgins. So uh, just my commentary with that, I, um, I love uh, President Brigham and he doesn't mince words, you know, um, if he sins, it's none of your business. And, um, you know, uh, we're not supposed to um, condemn or, or judge um, other people. And he gives us this advice in, in, um, in, uh, um, if we're so concerned about them that we need to pray for them to, you know, to have the spirit that they need to, to, um, to repent of where they're at. Um, and, um, I, I love that, um, that he talks about, um, that we shouldn't be surprised as saints that this trials that we're going through they're they're how we, how we said, you know, just a little, uh, uh, nothing compared to what we're, we're going to, um, be having to be subjected to. And that when you are true disciples of the savior, that we should be expecting these things. And because we are going through them, that we should be rejoicing because it is his elect that are being tried and that we should be, um, I guess, accounted as a um, um, a confirmation to us that we're in the right path. If we're being persecuted and we're being uh, chased by the enemy in the multiple ways that, that they can, um, whether they're within or without the church, uh, uh, persecuting us for um, uh, standing for the for the doctrine of Christ. And um, so um, here um, in being uh, spiritually refined, I thought that was really neat that uh, Elder Neil, Mill Axwell, Neil A. Maxwell said that, that we're already fine, but we're being further refined. And um, I, I, I mentally went there in that, the gross, and here he says the gross, uh, make the more gross, more pure. Um, the big obvious things in our lives uh, to this point have been removed, you know. Uh, I don't think that uh, most saints have problems with, you know, drugs or alcohol or adultery, or maybe they do, I don't know. But, um, or or having difficulty living living their covenants. But it's the more little bitty things that um that are being brought now um through the refining process so that we can be uh more uh refined uh is what spoke to me here is that um I, every time i turn left and right there's just another trial and um i i'm just like you know okay here, here's another one let's, let's okay here's another one and um, they don't affect me as they did before. Mind you, I'm not asking for more, uh, but I think that um, I, I hope that you're encouraged that um, as the, the, the apostles are telling us that our suffering or our trials are to uh, 
refine us, to build us and strengthen us as um, the easy life will never do. There's not anything that's going to come along our way that's going to be um, that's going to build character and build us um, to be uh, like our Savior than um, uh, trials. And so um, I'm ready for all that he has um, for me and for us, for our family. And so that was what I had to uh, share. Um, Courtney, you want to add anything to um, to this um, section here? Yeah, I really liked it a lot. Um, what it reminded me of is recently in our ward, there was a young man who left for his mission. And I'll never forget um, his dad who got up to spoke. And he talked about how, what he wanted for his son's mission, right? And he said, I hope his mission is hard. I hope that he has to rely on the Lord 100%. That he, there are days he's physically broken, emotionally broken, spiritually broken. And I hadn't ever thought thought of it that way but he said I hope that it's hard enough that he runs towards the savior and I hadn't ever like put that together you know because a lot of times people are like oh I hope you know my my kids learn to love the people and they can speak the language and that they're able to share their testimonies you know, and his perspective was so different. His was, I hope that it's challenging. I hope that it makes him into a better man than he is now. And I think in a lot of ways, I kind of changed how I see trials as well. Because I thought about, you know, we have our loving Heavenly Father who has known us forever knows what our future holds, knows what we need. And I wonder if sometimes he's like, this is what will help you run to me. This will help you turn from the prodigal son. This will help you be rededicated. This will help you get rid of, you know, whatever that imperfection is in your life. And I think a lot of times for me personally, and I can only talk for myself, I have to have that pain of who I am that I no longer want to be. Like that's what has to help me to change. I have to see that the Lord has a better way. That you know, all of my sense of control and running my life the way that I think it should be run, all of that had to be stripped away. I had to completely surrender. So all of my trials were to get me to that point. And I've had some really big trials, especially lately, trials that I never thought I would go through but I'm grateful for them because they created that space in me that said, I don't want to be this person. I want to be changed. I don't ask for the trial to be changed anymore. I ask to be different. And I think that's really what, what I got from your talk or from your um, insight. Yeah, sometimes the trials are, are um, uh, for me, mostly is being um, on the sidelines, you know, and watching things and me wanting to, you know, put my hand in it. And um, that's really hard for me to sit back and not be a participant and not, um, you know, help in the, in the circumstances. And a lot of times it's, that's part of the of the trial and uh, you know especially when it comes to loved ones um seeing them uh go through something and um, um you're wanting to 
to help, but it's very clear that it's not, that's not your, your journey. That's, you know, that's their journey. And it's, it's equally as painful. It makes me think about, um, uh, Mary and, um, her, um, seeing her son, you know, uh, being crucified and, um, scorned and lashed and everything that he went through. And she's seeing this, um, um, it wasn't by anybody's um, wrong, either by her or by him, right? It was it was uh, the will of the father, and um, and uh, uh, painful as that trial is to see and and uh, know and accept the will of the father um, is difficult. But look at the at the at the long game. Yes, is is difficult to do. Yeah, I think anymore I pray for trials that will change me. And it's hard. It's definitely hard. But we had a really good talk in sacrament today. And the lady also talked about, um, you know, the five foolish virgins, the five, five wise virgins. And she talked about, you know, like drip by drip, oil by oil, right? You know, she talked about how sometimes we get like a huge amount of oil in our lamps and it's like just pouring in by the gallons. And there's other times in our life where we struggle to get like one drip a day in there. And um, it helped put things in perspective, I think, with that as well, because once you get to that point like all the preparation is done, you either have or you don't. And recognizing how the Lord helps you on that journey so that when the time comes, you know that you have sufficiently prepared. I think there's a lot of strength in just knowing that your life is in accordance with what God wants. You know, that was the whole part of Lectures on Faith with Joseph Smith. He talked about there's no greater peace than knowing your life is acceptable to the Lord. And think about the trials that he went through. Good. All right. The second point for today and the last one for this evening, um, we send our prayers out to uh, KB who has um, been uh, hit with COVID and she's been very sick all week. So we want to make sure to keep her in our prayers. Um, the second um, insight I had was out of Second Peter uh, chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to try to combine what we were just talking about in um, about our fiery trial and then transition into this of uh, our uh, divine nature. Uh, the verses uh, read, Simon Peter, servant as an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the power of Jesus Christ, I can develop my divine nature. Do you ever feel that becoming like Jesus Christ and developing his attributes is not possible? Elder Robert D. Hales offered this encouraging thought about how we can develop Christ-like attributes. The attributes of the Savior are interwoven characteristics added one to another, which develop in us in interactive ways. In other words, we cannot obtain one Christ-like characteristic without also obtaining and influencing others. As one characteristic becomes strong, so do many more. Each Christ-like quality we develop helps us weave a spiritual tapestry of discipleship. As you read 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11, ponder the attributes of the divine nature listed these, in these verses. In your experience, how are they interwoven, as Elder Hales described? How, they, how do they build on each other? What else do you learn from these verses about the process of becoming more Christ-like? You might also ponder the exceeding great and precious promises God gives his saints, including you. Elder David A. Bednar's message, Exceeding Great and Precious Promises, can help you understand what those promises are and how to receive them. Throughout his second epistle, Peter emphasized the significance of having the knowledge of God. At the opening of this epistle, Peter taught that as God's followers receive increased knowledge of him, grace and peace will be multiplied in their lives and all things that pertain to life and godliness will be provided. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught about the importance of, of coming to know God. It is one thing to know about God and another to know about God and another to know him. We know about him when we were when we learned that he is a personal being in whose image man is created. When we learn that the son is in the express image of his father's person, when we learn that both the father and the son possess certain specific attributes and powers, but we know them in the sense of gaining eternal life when we enjoy and experience the same things they do. To know God is to think what he thinks, to feel what he feels, to have the power he possesses, to comprehend the truths he understands, and to do what he does. Those who know God become like him and have his kind of life, which is eternal life. The prophet Joseph Smith explained the importance of gaining knowledge. The principle of knowledge is the principle of salvation. This principle can be comprehended by the faithful and diligent, and everyone that does not obtain knowledge sufficient to be saved will be condemned. The principle of salvation is given us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Peter said that God's exceeding great and precious promises allow us to partake of the divine nature as we escape the corruption that is in the world. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught that exceeding great and precious promises refer to the promises of eternal life, which is the greatest of all the gifts of God. Elder McConkie also taught that to be partakers of the divine nature means to become as God is, enjoying the full every characteristic perfection and attribute which he possesses and which dwell in him independently. While serving as a member of the 70 elders, Spencer J. Condy listed some of God's promises that help us become more like our Heavenly Father. The Lord's countless exceeding great and precious promises include forgiveness of our sins when we confess them and forsake them. Opening the windows of heaven is a promise claimed by those who pay a faithful tithe and finding great treasures of knowledge accrues to those who observe the word of wisdom. Becoming unspotted from the world is a promise to those who keep the Sabbath holy. Divine guidance and inspiration are promised to those who feast upon the words of Christ and who liken all scripture unto themselves. The Lord also promised that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is right, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given unto you. We are promised that the Holy Ghost will be our constant companion when we let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly. We can claim the spiritually liberating promise of fasting, which will lose the band, loose the bands of wickedness onto undo our heavy burdens and break every yoke. Those who are sealed in holy temples and who faithfully keep their covenants will receive God's glory. 
which shall be a fullness and continuation of the seeds forever and ever. Speaking of the divine nature that we can obtain through God's promises, President Ezra Taft Benson explained, The Apostle Peter spoke of the process by which a person can be made a partaker of the divine nature. This is important, for if we truly become partakers of the divine nature, we shall become like the Savior. The virtues outlined by Peter are part of the divine nature, or the Savior's character. These are the virtues we are to emulate if we would be more like him. Furthermore, by attaining these attributes, we grow in the knowledge of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. In 2015, Sister Rosemary W. Uh, M. Wixom, in her talk in October, Discovering the, Divi the Divinity Within, um, she quoted Job in uh, Job 33, saying, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. She further states that we come into this world trailing clouds of glory. The family proclamation to the world teaches that each of us, each one of us is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents. And each of us has a divine nature and destiny. Heavenly Father generally, generously shares a portion of his, divine, of his divinity within us. That divine nature comes as a gift from him with a love that only a parent can feel. We come to this earth to nurture and discover the seeds of divine nature that are within us. And we know why. Elaine Cannon, a former Young Women General President, said, There are two important days in a woman's life. The day she is born and the day she finds out why. Again, this applies to uh, uh, the men. We know why. We have come to this earth to build, to help build his kingdom and to prepare for the second coming of his son, Jesus Christ. With every breath we take, we strive to follow him. The divine nature within each of us is, is refined and magnified by the effort we make to draw nearer to our father and his son. Our divine nature has nothing to do with our personal accomplishments, the status we achieve, the number of marathons we run, or our popularity and self-esteem. Our divine nature comes from God. It was established in an existence that preceded our birth and will continue on into eternity. We identify with our divine nature as we feel and give the love of our Father in heaven. We have the agency to nurture it, let it flourish, and help it grow. Peter said we are given precious promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature. As we understand who we are, daughters and sons of God, we begin to feel those precious promises. Looking out through a window, not just into a mirror, allows us to see ourselves as his. We are naturally turned to him in prayer. We are eager to read his words and to do his will. We are able to take our validation vertically from him, not horizontally from the world around us or from those on Facebook or Instagram. If you ever have a question that spark of divinity within you, kneel in prayer and ask Heavenly Father, am I really thy daughter or son and thou, thou love me? Elder M. Russell Ballard said, one of the sweetest messages the Spirit will relay is how the Lord feels about you. We are his, Paul said. The Spirit itself bears beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Often the first primary song we learn is, I am a child of God. Now it is time to take that beloved phrase, I am a child of God, and add the words, therefore what? We might even ask questions such as these, what will I do to live my life as a child of God? How can I develop the divine nature that is within me? President Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, God sent you here to prepare for a future greater than anything you can imagine. That future, a day at a time, comes alive when you do more than just exist. It comes alive when you live your life to the full measure of your creation. This invites the Lord into your life and you begin to let his will become yours. We learn because of our divine nature. Divine nature breathes into us the desire to know these eternal truths for ourselves. A young woman named Amy recently taught me this lesson when she wrote, it is hard being a teenager these days. The path is getting narrower. Satan is really trying. It is either right or wrong. There is no in between. 
She continued, good friends are sometimes hard to find, even when you think you have best friends who will never leave that could change for any reason. That is why I'm so glad that I have a family, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost who can be my companions whenever things with friends go wrong. Amy went on to say, one night I was troubled. I told my sister I didn't know what to do. Later that night, her sister sent a text and quoted Elder Jeffrey R. Holland when he said, don't give up. Don't you quit. You keep walking. You keep trying. There is help and happiness ahead. It will be all right in the end. Trust God and believe in good things to come. Amy explained, I remember greeting that and just praying that I, I would feel love from God if he really was there for me. She said, as soon as I asked and believed that he was there, I felt the most amazing, happy, warm feeling. Words can't describe it. I knew he was there and that he loved me. Because you are his child, he knows who you can become. He knows your fears and your dreams. He relishes your potential. He waits for you to come to him in prayer because you are his child. You not only need him, but he needs also. He also needs you. Those sitting around you right now in this meeting need you. The world needs you. Your divine nature allows you to be his trusted disciple to all his children. Once we begin to see the divinity in ourselves, we can see it in others. And we serve because, our divine, mm -hmm. because of our divine nature. Divine nature breathes into us the desire to serve others. And so this is where I add my um, thoughts um, to uh, these uh, scriptures and these um, thoughts are from um, uh, these authorities, so the apostles and authorities. So Peter is or telling us, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Paul is telling us through Peter, um, uh, I'm sorry, Peter is telling us in this epistle that we have this divine nature and that there are characteristics that we have been given you know, before we came here and we have the capacity to um, grow these um, um, attributes, which are like um, our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ exemplified these when he was here on this earth. So for me, as I, I, I read this and pondered this, I, I, um, I thought, well, what, what is the lesson here as she's saying here? Um, we grow in um, um, this divine nature by emulating um, the Savior, right? And and they they uh, they're not independent of one another. These attributes. There's one um, that um, that builds on another, and the other grows more, and the other one uh, nurtures the other one. Um, my experience. Um, in serving in the house of the Lord um, has enabled me to tap into a different characteristic that maybe you as saints have been able and have been uh, able to tap into it in, in, in the past. But in, in serving in the temple, I've uh, tapped into uh, the power that uh, we all um want to attain as we as we uh, grow and learn in the temple. And uh, part of, of our call is to help gather Israel, and that's how we do it. And we there's temple workers that are needed to be able to enable uh, those that are gathering Israel through their relatives. But there has to be people that are in the temple that are serving, and they serve uh, also in that capacity in helping um, gather Israel. And as we do those things in the house of the Lord, because it is his house, his house is filled with power. And that power is charity, one of those great and wondrous um, attributes. I love serving in the temple because each and every week I grow in seeing each son and daughter each with different abilities and uh, capabilities. And I see them through his eyes. That is why our president 
our, our beloved president uh, Nelson has told us to go to the temple and go often and serve in the temple and bring those relatives uh, names. But it also means to serve in the temple in the capacity as being a, a temple worker and uh, uh, ministering because it's not all about just us. It's about all of us. And I love being there and experiencing the incredible love that's there. And that's where we learn more of those wonderful attributes and tap into that divine nature. I uh, have a testimony of this and I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's a great insight. I really like the way that um, you tied it together with our divine nature. I always question um, as, as we started out that do we ever think that we can, you know, attain some of those attributes, you know, and um, we do well, that. We do that. It, he says, uh, Elder uh, Hale says that that we we develop them in interactive ways. In other words, we 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 care. We obtain them with obtaining and influencing others, and so loving um, your um, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ in the temple is uh, again practicing those things which emanate from from the savior and as you continue to do that you build on many more of those attributes yeah and i i think it's important to remember that all of the christ-like attributes like if you read and preach my gospel they're all gifts right they're gifts of the spirit and so we're not going to be able to develop a selfless gift without sharing it with others. Like the intention is not to become completely Christ-like all on your own, like a little island, like you live out there with the palm trees and the wind and the ocean, right? right. Like the only purpose for those gifts is for you to become that, um, the ability to share it with others, because that's ultimately what Christ did is his love for us was so perfect and so great that we now want to become like him. We want to develop those gifts, not just for ourselves, but for how we can influence others. And I think as a mom, that's one of the things that you really rely on is how can I influence my children? How can I influence my family? And the answer always comes back to Christ. Yes, always. Well, great. So uh, that is what we have for this week. Um, and um, we will uh, see you uh, next week. And we will be covering, um, actually, we'll be covering um, uh, First John, right? And Jude, right? First John, which are short, uh, short uh, letters, I guess. Yep. First and uh, first uh, one through um, all three letters, I guess, to, to John and uh, Jude. So we'll be covering those next week. And so thank you so much for um, listening. I hope that there's something there for you as we've uh, shared what we've learned and uh, our thoughts. Um, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. Bye. Okay.